So everybody, please help me welcome uh, Dr. Dave Karen up to the Wow, Friday night, uh, a, a weekend of holidays, and I think I'm going to have all my lectures and all my classes on Friday nights from now on. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mike and the invitation to speak here again. Uh, I love this aquarium. I've been here a number of times. I've given a couple lectures here, actually. Uh, one in, I guess, a previous incantation of this series a while ago and, and tonight, and actually one other that will... Uh, come up in the process of, of showing you today what's, uh, what I'm going to show you. So I have a little medical uh, test for you. So normally at USC, my undergraduate classes, I lecture pre-med. That's what biology is there. A lot of them are pre-meds, or they think they are. Uh, many of them do become doctors. Uh, so what's the diagnosis here? This is, note this is from Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. Okay, so this was a patient who was 28, said he was feeling until three days ago. He and his girlfriend went to the Bahamas uh, to celebrate his birthday. After a long day of swimming and snorkeling, they decided to try a restaurant uh, they had heard good things about. They ordered seafood. She had a red snapper, he had the barracuda, and then they went out dancing. Uh, they got out on the dance floor and the patient, who was the guy, doubled over. He was caught off guard by intense pain, knife through his gut, and, and took his breath away. Then abdominal cramps, diarrhea, vomiting, fever. So what's the diagnosis? Food poisoning, right? Who said Seguatera? Yeah, and somebody over here, too. Excellent. That's two. I've, I've had as many as one in a crowd once, and it was from a poor fellow who actually had Seguatera poisoning. Um, there's more to this. So he went to sleep for two days. I uh, finally felt well enough to get out. Uh, he dressed. He noticed his hands were clumsy. His feet felt weird. They felt like they were asleep like he was walking on a carpet of little nails. Uh, his girlfriend uh, bought him a smoothie from a juice stand. What a nice girlfriend. Uh, first drink smelled delicious. He took a sip and he spit it out. The icy cold drink felt as if it had come straight off the stove, uh, as if it were boiling hot. Uh, he, he took another sip and his mouth burned. And he felt it was too hot to swallow. Essentially reversal of senses. He's clearly having uh, some sort of a, a, a neural effect here. Uh, and the causative organism, as was said, is, uh, or the poison, is, a, is called ciguatera toxin. It is something that is uh, a neurotoxin, and it is common in the tropics and in the subtropics. Uh, it's amazing that somebody at Jacoby in the Bronx recognized what this was and diagnosed it correctly. Uh, in fact, what often happens is people go undiagnosed or, you know, you've been to that seafood restaurant that you won't speak about or go to again where you had a really bad night and then you just kind of passed it off, oh, somebody didn't wash their hands, somebody didn't handle the food properly, but you never know. Um, this was very different, a, a very nasty toxin. It comes from eating high in the food chain, that is, this large predatory fish. Remember, he had the barracuda. And uh, so it, it happens that this is a little tiny organism. Uh, this is 20 micrometers, so this organism is only about 0 0.04 millimeters in diameter, very small. And even though it's very tiny, obviously this barracuda didn't need it. But what happened is this organism sits down on little fronds of algae that grow on the reef. And little tiny reef fish eat those algae, and bigger fish eat those little fish, and bigger fish still, until you get up to a large predatory fish. And while the energy and the, the carbon in those food sources diminishes as it goes through the food chain, the toxin does not. So it bioaccumulates. And by the time you get up to something this large, if you eat a big chunk of barracuda, you can get a good slug of ciguatera toxin like that guy did, and you can suffer from those symptoms. A microscopic alga, but very serious. Should we be concerned? Yeah, it's tropical, subtropical. Well, remember, global travel. That guy was in the Bahamas the day before, got sick there, and brought it back with him. He was in the Bronx by the time he got attacked by this quote unquote tropical disease. We have a global seafood trade. We've, we move seafood all over the world. And there have been recent articles that have, uh, you've probably read them, they've been on NPR, they've been all over the place showing that when you actually go in and you test the seafood that restaurants and, and seafood places are selling as fish X or seafood at Y, they 
often aren't seafood X or, or shellfish Y or whatever. There's something quite different. So there is an issue in, in that this could be a, a, an issue for us. The other issue here is climate change. You know, the climate, the distribution of many of these tropical, subtropical organisms, while it may be below us now, we're kind of on the border between a subtropical to temperate climate. Some of those subtropical species may move north as climate changes. So, so we do have concern here. Right now, there are about 10,000 to 50,000 estimated cases of ciguatera because it isn't easy to diagnose each year. There probably are more, and there may be even more as, as uh, distributions of the organism change. OK, so just to give you an idea of where we're headed uh, in, in this talk tonight, uh, here's the road map. And I'm going to give you the conclusions so, so you don't have to worry about what, what you're trying to get here. Uh, harmful algal bloom, so you'll see this abbreviation, HABS. Uh, people think of red tides, and certainly there are uh, discolorations of the water due to the pigments of some algae that, that cause what, what looks like the, the water to turn red or other colors. There are green tides, there are brown tides. Upscale neighborhoods even have mahogany tides, believe it or not. <laughs> it's true, there is a mahogany tide. Uh, they're not always harmful, but they're an explosion of growth. Uh, we, we consider them harmful when they start to do something wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean acute toxicity, uh, but it can be a whole variety of things, as you'll see. Uh, they have increased. HABs, harmful algal blooms, or the abbreviation HABs, have increased in frequency and severity during the last decade or so in our region. We pretty much know this now. The bad news is they've increased within the last few decades on a global scale, and, and I'll show you a little bit of that. This is partly an issue of increased awareness uh, and partly an issue that they actually have simply gotten more frequent and more severe. Uh, this is a, an issue of an emerging disease. You probably know uh, about the difference between that uh, from a human health point of view. So uh, those of you who have heard of um, West Nile, of course, you know what that is you know that they can almost track it back to the person who got off the plane in New York at you know, day X, and then it just swept across the country. Truly an emerging disease. Wasn't here before, to anybody's knowledge. Once it was there, it, we just saw it march across the country, mostly in bird populations. That's an emerging issue, an emerging disease. Emerging awareness is if you've heard of Lyme disease, which hopefully most of you have. Lyme disease is named after Lyme, Connecticut. L-Y-M-E, not L-I-M-E. Has nothing to do with margaritas, but it does have to do with Lyme, Connecticut. And there, it was discovered, it was identified what the symptoms looked like, the, org the causative organism. And when they found it in Lyme, Connecticut, when they documented it, and they documented the symptoms, they immediately found it all over the country. It wasn't an emerging disease at that time. It was an emerging awareness. And in fact, Lyme disease is considered one of our great pandemics right now. In case you were, didn't know that. OK, so it, we'll talk about this uh, awareness as well as uh, the issue itself that is emerging uh, occurrence. Harmful al algal blooms in cover many, encompass many issues. They vary in activity and severity. The causes are complex. So one of the things we're always pushed to do is, well, figure out what causes it and stop that thing. And it's not necessarily one thing when you talk about the whole range of harmful algae that are out there and the various things that they cause. So there is no silver bullet that we can simply identify and, and uh, cure all the ills of, of harmful algal blooms. Uh, there are some consistent California hab hot spots that are appearing. And I think uh, very at the very end, I'll talk about how they are probably going to be the key to understanding what leads to these events, and can we prevent them or mitigate them in some way? And then finally, what we've done by working with a lot of the, the animal rescue groups and, and care groups around the region is we've been able to show that there is a really strong relationship to some of the toxic events that we see in the water and, and animals that are suffering from the uh, illnesses caused by those toxic, uh, toxic conditions and toxins. Okay. So having said that, what makes harmful algae harmful? It can be a variety of things. It can be the production of toxins, as I just mentioned, in the case of ciguatera. Uh, it, it, there are a number of toxins that we know about now. There are undoubtedly some that are still out there that we don't know. And there will be an emerging awareness for some of these in the near future, I think. 
Uh, but it can be as simple as gill irritation and clogging, feather wetting. Feather wetting doesn't sound like a particularly terrible thing. Sounds like what small birds do in the nest, maybe. But uh, in fact, feather wetting is some algae can make a surfactant-like material. It's like a soapy-like material. It wets the bird's feathers. Once the feathers get wet, at least for seabirds, they sit in the water. The water gets to their body. The heat goes out of their body, and, and they get compromised, and they can die from it. Gill irritation is what it sounds like. It doesn't sound like it would be really a bad thing, but in fact, gills can be irritated to the point where the fish just die. In fact, we've had several incidences in the last year within Southern California where entire lakes full of fish have died as a consequence of some of these things. Uh, if you get enough algae in the water, it doesn't matter if they're toxic or non-toxic. If, if you have a situation where they are producing a lot of biomass, once that biomass starts to degrade, the decomposition uses oxygen, and hypoxia, which is low oxygen, or anoxia, which is the lack of oxygen, can occur in the water and kill things simply because there isn't oxygen for uh, the animals to breathe. Uh, reduced light penetration. Sometimes these things get so thick that they block the light going to the bottom. And even in relatively shallow areas, shallow coastal areas and lagoons, you can get enough light blocked that the seagrasses can't grow on the bottom. And those seagrasses are wonderful nurseries and, and, and sources of food for a lot of organisms. And you can have what, are, what do we term food web disruption. Uh, something simply stops things from, from going on in the food chain. Oops, and I will give you examples of that. So having said that, are, are these issues new? Uh, and the answer is no, they're not. And this is just one example. I dug down into the literature and I found a, a, re, a report from 1902, which is an unusual occurrence of dinoflagellates, which is a type of algae, on the California coast. 1902, and they talk about the, the appearance of uh, large amounts of, of organisms in enormous numbers, and guess where? Right here in San Pedro. So these things, some of these things at least, have been around for a while. Uh, they have not gone unnoticed, um, but the, in recent years we've seen a lot more of them. So, do you have to worry about everything that's in the water? Is it safe to go in the water? You know, what happens when you go swimming in, in the coast? So if you go out right now and you jump in the water, go underwater and you swallow a teaspoon, just a teaspoon of water, what do you get? A lot of plankton, that's right. That's exactly what you get. You get a lot of everything. You get about 100 million viruses in you. You get about 10 million bacteria. You get about 5,000 algae, microalgae. You get about 3,000 protozoa, which are little single-celled organisms that eat all those other things. You get a lot of stuff. Should you worry? Yes. <laughs> Smart. Actually, most are harmless. The vast majority of them are harmless. Every now and then, there are some that are not so harmless. Uh, we have an added consideration on our coastline where we have an urbanized ocean that we do have other sources that typically come from land and are our doing where you can have input of things that you don't want going into the water, various you know, materials and storm drains and so forth. But naturally, in the ocean, you can get algal abundances that are much higher than that and if they are toxic, they create a health risk. They create a particular health risk once they get into our food chain. So you can go to a variety of places in the country and around the world and see signs like, like these various signs that tell you, warning, this area is closed, particularly if you want to do any shellfishing. Don't do it. And why? Because shellfish, particularly things like mussels and clams, are very, very good filter feeders. And they will filter very small particles, including algae, out of the water. And if those algae have even a tiny amount of toxin in them, once they get into the belly of the clam or the mussel, they get a lot of them in there. So you can get a significant amount of toxin inside one of these. And if you eat that clam or mussel, you can be in trouble. So increased awareness or increased occurrence. This is the map of the occurrence of a very nasty toxin called paralytic shellfish poisoning, PSP. In 1970, the red dots show the, in, the places where it had been documented. In 2012, this is now the, the map 
that's showing where the occurrence of that, that toxin has been documented. Increased awareness, yes. And there are people who will tell you, no, 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 we're seeing huge numbers. No, it's much worse. There is a component that is definitely increased severity, increased frequency of these. But increased awareness cannot be sorted out. So it does contribute to this. Nonetheless, it either means that we've got a lot more places that we need to worry about today that we didn't in 1970, or we were missing a lot of places in 1970. We just weren't looking for it yet. And that is certainly part of the story. We weren't looking for it. If we narrow down to just the United States, uh, you'll see there's kind of these color-coded regions around. And down here, you see all these little acronyms. Uh, if, you don't have to worry about all of them, but the two that you might make note of here are this thing called PSP in our region and ASP. PSP is what I just told you about, paralytic shellfish poisoning. The other one is ASP, amnesic shellfish poisoning. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of walk through some of the issues we've got in our region, sort of from least dangerous or nasty to the most. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of indication of, of what these things are. So fairly innocuous red tides. Uh, they can deplete the oxygen. So uh, if you get enough material in the water, even if it's benign, uh, when the lights go out, everybody uses oxygen, including the algae themselves. And you can deplete the, the water of oxygen. The two organisms that are up there are in a group of algae, if you know anything about these, called dinoflagellates. And this is one here. It's a little less than a millimeter in size. It's actually quite large as microalgae go. They usually go down to bacterial size. And, and you can see here, this is a small boat, and it's dragging a chain of instruments through this, what is an obviously large and bright accumulation. This was taken right off of the uh, the Coast of California by Peter Franks down at Scripps. Uh, this one is all over the web if you, if you look for these. Uh, the organism is fairly innocuous, but when you get buildups like this, uh, that can cause problems for organisms. If you go on the web and you do red tide or noctiluca, which is the name of the genus, and you type in Australia after it, this is what you get. Uh, you can see these huge accumulations. Here this water is beet red. And there's no you know, amplification of color or anything in that. That's real. Uh, these are, have become so common in Australia that they consider this noctiluca, this alga, an invasive species now in coastal waters. It's caused huge blooms. Not particularly nasty, which is a good thing, because here's mom at the beach bringing the baby, and, and the baby-to-be to come and see what is a potentially red, nasty, rock toxic tide. So luckily, that one's not so bad. One of the benefits of Noctiluca, the, the species name is Scintillans, which, as the name might imply, uh, this is a bioluminescent organism. And on beaches, uh, when these things bloom, it can cause some really spectacular light shows at night. Uh, an organism which we do have in our region, and that was the other one up there, this is lingul something called Lingulodinium polyhedrum. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, this red color that I hope you can see here is around uh, La Jolla. So La Jolla is over here. Here's the Scripps Pier, if you know where that is. This is a 20-liter carboy, so it's like five gallons of water. It's sort of like a water bottle, cooler water bottle size thing. And you can't see through that. That water is unconcentrated. This is a bucket that has about five inches, maybe four inches of water in it, where one of my brave graduate students kind of trudged in did one of these routines and came back and took a picture of it. So, so these organisms do get up to tremendous abundance in our waters. Luckily, this particular one doesn't produce much in the way of toxins. Nonetheless, it can cause problems. And this is kind of a, a crazy looking little figure, but it actually is pretty simple. What you're looking at is uh, a number of days down here, so starting at this time here and then watching through about 45 days. These black dots here are the amount of pressure it takes to push water through a desalination uh, reverse flow filter, or a, uh, a desalination filter. So you have reverse osmosis filters that the way you make reverse osmosis water, the way you get the salts out, is you push that water under high pressure through very, very fine meshwork. And it literally filters the salts out, and it lets the pure water pass through. Uh, what you're seeing in this particular figure is that this uh, pressure, which is called transmembrane pressure, goes up over time. 
and it coincides with an increase in chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll fluorescence is the amount of photosynthetic pigment in the water, and it's indicative of the amount of algae in the water. And this was actually one of these lingual adenium blooms taking place right off of El Segundo while there was a small plant, small desalination pilot plant in operation. And what they found is when this bloom came in, it took a lot of pressure to push the water through the filter because there's a lot of algae in there and they were clogging the filter. So very practical, very economically costly thing to do if you're going to do a desalination operation. We've actually worked with the plant that they're putting in in Carlsbad to try to estimate whether or not a bloom of, of algae in the water could present a problem for the operation of that plant. And, and so there are real considerations, even when you don't have a toxin or any sort of any sort produced. Noxious foams and scums, uh, food web disrup disruption. Um, I used to get calls from a person who was the director of the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. And she knew I did algal work. I had given talks there. And she'd always call me up and say, Dave, I've got scum for you. And it's like, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> What else do you say? Um, what she was talking about is there are accumulations of algae that have occurred on a number of our summers now. I think we didn't have much in the way this past summer, but three previous summers, I would get phone calls with saying, somebody saying, I've got this weird green scum. And we were able to identify what this organism is. This is a micrograph of it here. And, and it's a very tiny little cell. This thing is probably maybe 10 times the size of a bacterium very small, but when it accumulates in very large numbers, this is a Santa Monica Pier, so this was taken by the former director there, and what you can see is uh, there's huge accumulations of this at the surface. This is an organism, I know what this, this organism is, it's a thing called Tetracelmus, and it is an organism that is such a good food source that people who do aquaculture feed this stuff to their larvae. It's a very good food source. So what's going on? Why isn't this just being scooped up by the organisms in the water? And the trick this organism seems to be playing, which has now been confirmed by some studies, is that it can tolerate huge amounts of ultraviolet radiation. And, and it gets right up at the surface, as you can see it in those scums, because a lot of the things that eat it can't tolerate that sort of UV exposure. So they stay down in the deeper water. And it has, therefore, a little bit of a refuge, if you will, and, and, and can re, uh, grow to these numbers and in the process of doing that, it actually gets away from being cycled into the food web, and therefore it, you know, it, it grows and it disrupts the food web. Another organism that does this is something called Phaeocystis. So this is the organism here. It is colonial. The little green dots are the algae. And again, they're maybe 10 micrometers, 10 times the size of, of a bacterium, maybe even a little smaller than that but it forms these large bubbles of mucus. So they're water-filled bubbles, and the cells grow right on the surface of the bubble, if you will, the skin of the, of the bubble, sort of like on the skin of a balloon. And, and in doing that, they actually create a sort of a mucousy material to, to make that bubble. And when the organisms release themselves from that mucus, the mucus itself can actually stay there. It gets whipped up by the winds and it creates this kind of meringue type of material. So if you've gone to the beach and you've seen you know, sort of that deep of foam and you wondered what it was, that's usually what you're, you're looking at. Uh, again, I got a call uh, you know, years ago saying, you know, I've got somebody whose kids were on the beach, these are the kids, and um, they were playing in this foam and you know, was wondering what was causing this. And I said, well, I think I know, get a sample. And sure enough, we found these organisms in the water. And, and about two days later, I got a, an email from the person whose kids these were, and, and it said, uh, so is that stuff toxic? And, <laughs> really? Now you ask me that? <laughs> it is not toxic, but it is what we, ter what we usually call noxious, meaning things don't like to eat it. It apparently doesn't taste good at the microscopic level to microscopic animals that might eat it. And so, you know, this is a strategy that organisms can play. The best thing you can do if you're really a part of the food chain, we're not really a part of the food chain, but if you're really a part of the food chain, one strategy is you taste like crap because nothing wants to eat you. <laughs> if you taste bad, things leave you alone and they eat other things, so you benefit. 
So there are large blooms of this um, in the North Sea, off of between England and, and the continent. And in those regions, they actually know this stuff. The, the sailors know it from way back. And they used to, I thought very inappropriately, call it Dutchman's Backy Juice, which literally means Dutchman's Tobacco Juice. So you know, tobacco juice is really nasty stuff. The fishermen there knew that if they saw this junk in the water, they weren't going to catch any fish, and they'd haul their nets and they'd go someplace else. Um, but you know, you, you get away with non-PC things at that point, I guess. So you're going to love this picture then. Whoa. Again, if you go on the web and you Google seafoam in Australia, you will get this picture, which immediately begs the question: What is with Australia? Okay. You know, <laughs> But it is, it is probably, he looks like he's having a pretty good time, uh, but that's quite a wall of foam there. Wow. So it can accumulate quite, to quite a degree. OK, so those are sort of going from benign to kind of foams and scums, which are noxious, but not really outright toxic, to things that we have around here that are truly, truly toxic. And the first one here that I'll talk about, this, this, this is two of them. This organism is actually dividing here. They kind of look weird. They look a little like you know, the blimp with a keel on it and a little bit of a fin in the back. Uh, this is another organism or group of organisms from the, the phytoplankton group uh, dinoflagellates, if you know them. Dinophysis is probably something that you will hear about. You don't hear much about it now, and we don't worry too much about it. But it produces, when it's present, and it is present in our waters, it can produce diuretic shellfish poisoning, which, as the name implies, is tons of fun. Uh, it causes a whole variety of, including uh, diarrhea, other symptoms, vomiting, nausea, and so forth. There are no known fatalities, but trust me, you probably want to die if you get this. It's pretty nasty. The other factor here is, and this is something we worry about with shellfish poisoning, so it usually is termed DSP, diuretic shellfish poisoning. Uh, it is also the compound, which is okadaic acid, which I'm not you know, going to bother you with uh, uh, chemistry, but it is also known to be a strong tumor promoter. So in the lab, this has been used as a means of inducing tumors in otherwise healthy tissues. So it is definitely something that we should be watching for, and it is on our watch list. We have seen small amounts of okadaic acid in the water in our region, but not really any that's of a major accumulation yet. But this one may be a truly emerging issue that we have to deal with. They had to deal with this just recently on the Corpus Christi region or area in, uh, on the coast of Texas. A few years ago, they were just about to have their oyster festival where they go out and collect a zillion oysters and drink beer and eat oysters, I guess. It's an oyster festival. I'm sure it's a beer festival, too. Uh, but just before that, they got a big warning from one of the research groups out there that said they saw large amounts of okadaic acid in this species in the water. And so they immediately went to Louisiana and bought a whole bunch of oysters from them and brought them back. <laughs> but we do have to watch for that one. This one is, uh, there are a group of organisms, I won't bother you with the names, but this is an electron micrograph showing several of them that are kind of linked together. They occur as singles, or they can get together as big, long chains. Here's a, a couple of singles. And again, they're in this group called dinoflagellates, which is uh, a big class of algae. Uh, these organisms produce a class of toxins called saxitoxins, which are responsible for the, the common name paralytic shellfish poisoning, which, as the name implies, is uh, exceptionally dangerous. It actually uh, will shut down your, your nervous function, including your uh, uh, autonomous nervous system, which means your heart stops and you stop breathing. So it, is, it can be in dosage lethal, and it has been. It is something that is monitored carefully all over the world, basically, including on our coast, because that was one of the two colors that you saw down in Southern California when I showed the, the um, uh, map of the United States. Uh, these organisms, it's not really known uh, why they hook together in these long chains, but it has been seen that when they do that, they actually can swim really, really fast through the water for their size, which means they can cover a lot of ground. Uh, and they all sort of have little hair-like structures. You can see the little hair-like structure over here. And these little wiggly things across their middle 
are actually one of these hair-like structures called a flagellum that is coiled around the body. So it spins kind of because that little uh, hair-like structure beats. And then it has another one that runs longitudinally, and it pushes it through the water. When you put a whole bunch of these together, it just flies through the water like a little chain of cells. And this one's just kind of curled up there. We, we call it lovingly the war canoe, because it's like everybody paddling on the same side. <laughs> Saxitoxins are, are a big deal. They are one of the strongest natural toxins produced in nature. So it blocks nerve impulses and it is nasty. The one that we hear most about around here is, is this compound, domoic acid. And it's produced by a class of algae called diatoms, particular types. There are a lot of good diatoms that get a black eye because of this but uh, it forms a glass structure. So they live in little glass houses that are kind of like the shape of a canoe. But what happens is the canoe, which is about a tenth of a millimeter in length, it's not very long, they hook up in chains kind of end to end. So they raft up, if you will. And when they do that, they form long hair-like strands in the water. So they're very easily filtered out of the water by things like clams and mussels and anchovies and sardines that, that use their gill rakers to, to really ingest these small particles. It is kind of the flip side of paralytic shellfish poisoning in that it is a neuro exciter. So while paralytic shellfish poisoning shuts down your nerves, this thing turns them on. And in fact, the, the, the compound, domoic acid, I love it. I, I got a call from a reporter years ago when we had an outbreak who said, you know, who are you? Da 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 da. You know, then I got all the information on me, and they said, okay, so tell me about demonic acid. <laughs> and that's, so there's, I often hear it that. Uh, but what this will do is the molecule itself looks a lot chemically like the molecule that transmits electrical signals in your nerves. So, you know, you've probably heard enough biology or enough neurology that you have these nerve endings, and there's a little connection that is made electrically. And there's a specific molecule that passes that electrical charge. And when it passes it from where it's coming from to where it's going, it excites that nerve. And, and that neural excitation, ex, uh, excitation is how the, the nerves work. Glutamate is the compound that transmits that electrical impulse. Domoic acid, it turns out, is a mimic of, of, demo, excuse me, of glutamate. Domoic acid will act, it'll get into your nerves, and it will keep firing your nerves when they're not supposed to fire until they literally burn out. If you get a little bit of it, you get nausea, vomiting, you know, some of these kinds of symptoms. If you get a little bit more of it, you can have loss of short-term memory, which is where the amnesic shellfish poisoning moniker comes from. If you get too much, you can die. People have died from this, but not a lot, because they figured out what it was pretty quickly, uh, and it was actually an incident that occurred in Prince Edward Island in uh, Canadian Maritime. And uh, they figured it out, and it showed up on our coast. The first documentation uh, was about 1989 or so. It was the first time that we knew about it on this coast. So there is extensive monitoring for domoic acid. Uh, it is something that, that we worry about, and, uh, and it's been on the coast for 15 years or so that we know of. Um, actually, it's more than that now. In Southern California, uh, we have most of the effects seen on marine mammals and, and birds, and usually pelicans or organisms that are eating filter feeding organisms, little shellfish at the beach and so forth. So the history of this, if you have, haven't heard this, is um, so this was first known on this coast 19 90s, I guess, is somewhere in there. Actually, it was 1998, was, there was a large, what was called an unusual mortality event, and they finally linked it to, to demoic acid. Uh, but in fact, uh, if you go back and you look at other unusual mortality events of marine mammals, uh, you know, what's going on there, uh, people have done that to try and figure out, has it really been on our coast longer than the 1990s? And so there actually was an article that was in the, the, the San, Santa Cruz Sentinel in 2006, 150 years of the Sentinel, thousands of birds floundering in the streets. The uh, following story was printed in the Santa Cruz Sentinel in August 1961. And it talks about a massive flight of sooty shearwaters fresh from a feast of anchovies. Remember anchovies, filter feeding fish. Collided with uh, shoreside structures from Pleasant Point 
to Rio del Mar during the night. And they came ashore. They were slamming into homes. Uh, they, there were stunned birds in the street. They were wandering around. Uh, they they uh, knocked down television and ter and ter yeah, uh, aerials. Remember television aerials? Um, they severed power, one power line. They did all this damage. This is almost certainly a, a, an incidence of domoic acid poisoning of these animals. We know what to look for now. I used to get phone calls saying, Dave, we've got an animal that's acting really weird. It's acting like it's got neurological problems. Now I get a phone call that says, Dave, we've got an animal that is displaying or exhibiting symptoms of domoic acid poisoning. Can you test the, the fluids? And so is, this is something that I think we have this emerging awareness retrospectively. Uh, the interesting thing, so you guys know what I'm putting up next, the crazy birds. 1961, yeah, uh, very famous uh, producer, director, uh, was actually uh, vacationing, or he's at his home in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and he specifically asked for that edition of the Sentinel. Now, I don't know how he knew that, but that's what the Sentinel claimed. And it went on, uh, apparently folklore has it, to become his inspiration for the movie The Birds. Uh, I gave this information verbally uh, to actually it was here. It was here in a small group of research librarians. Okay, know your stuff if you talk to research librarians. <laughs> so I gave this whole thing, and that, you know, as I'm saying this and going on with the talk, somebody, you know, it was a lunchtime talk, somebody jumps up and runs out of the room. I thought, wow, bad clams. Um, <laughs> came running back in five minutes. I mean, five minutes later, I've got it. You know, just in the middle of the talk, I've got it. You got what? I've got the article. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I had the proof, thank God I was right. <laughs> okay, so in 2003, actually 2002 into 2003, we had a big local event. It was typed by NOAA, an unusual mortality event. It was sea lions, dolphins, some pelicans, all kinds of things. They were dying on our shores. And the party line that I heard was, oh, well, they have a problem up in Monterey. We know about that. But those animals get sick up there. They swim or they fly down here and they die on our beaches. And I went, I don't know. <laughs> so I went out right in our backyard here. So here's the harbor up in here. And you don't need to worry about the units, but I measured domoic acid in the phytoplankton, in the algae, in the water. And so you just take a sample, you filter everything down onto a, a very fine filter. You take that and you analyze it for domoic acid. That number, I can tell you, 12, is a super high number. Okay? It was toxin, lots of toxin in the water right here. And you'll note that as you go away from, from this area, those numbers drop off by you know, a factor of 100 to 1,000. So there, this is what I call the aha moment, where it's, it's not the problem up north anymore. And in fact, since then, we have been monitoring. And we do it to the extent that funding allows us to do it sometimes more than others, uh, but we've seen a few massive blooms as a consequence. So here in 2006, the color here, the warmer colors are areas of higher concentrations of domoic acid, this, this toxin, this ASP, uh, uh, toxin in the water. And then uh, here again, the warm colors indicate, this is the, that, that line is the breakwater for the harbor, and you can see that it seems to be right at the mouth of, of the harbor. That was 2006 and 2007. And we've been continuing to monitor that because you know, the mechanism, it gets into either <laughs> shellfish or filter feeding fish, and then it can go directly into anything that, that might be in the, the food web of that organism. OK, so what we were able to do during 2006 and 2007, where we had all these animals landing, Nobody knew what was going on. We actually were working with the rescue centers to get samples, fluid samples of various types from them. And this graph looks pretty complicated, but it's pretty simple. The uh, little uh, dark area that you see here, a big blip here in the spring uh, of uh, 2006, and then another big blip in the spring of 2007. Those are animals stranding that are brought into centers. The, the green that you see there is the amount of domoic acid in phytoplankton at that time. And you can see there's a really good correlation here with all of these landings and a really good correlation here with all of the uh, uh, correlation with the, the toxin here and all of these strandings. These were the animals that we were able to actually test 
and show that they contain domoic acid. And when you look at the rest of the year, or the two parts of the two years, they're actually pretty quiet the rest of the time. So we were able to identify, and now as I say, you know, I get calls saying, oh, we've got an animal that looks like domoic acid. Uh, we've even gotten to the point where when we see it in the water, if they, we haven't seen animals stranded, we will sometimes notify the rescue center saying, heads up, you know, it's in the water and you might be seeing things happen pretty soon. Okay, great question of does this happen all the time? Well, uh, for saxitoxin, this is sort of average across the, the counties, coastal counties of California, average altogether. And what you're looking at are the maximum abundances of paralytic shellfish poison toxin, and then the, the averages over the year. And you can see that saxitoxins can kind of occur any time, but they, they, they don't seem to really have a season. But in the case of high concentrations of domoic acid, they tend to occur in the spring. Uh, there is often in other parts of California, there is a little blip also in the fall, which is kind of a classic thing that phytoplankton do. They grow really well in the spring and then they deplete the nutrients. And then as the, the, the winter winds or the storm winds kind of move the water around, they get a little more input of nutrients and they can show a little more growth. But in our area, that's where we've seen blooms over the last several years. Usually in somewhere between very earliest of February until maybe June, but usually April, May are the hot months if we get them. Why is that? Well, phytoplankton, the algae in the ocean, grow for the same reason your plants in your garden grow when you put nutrients on them. They grow when they get a burst of nutrients. And seasonally what happens in our region is you have something called an upwelling event. So the winds come down the coast at, at that time of year during the spring, and, and because of the, the movement of the water being affected by the Earth's rotation, that water is actually stripped out to sea. And when it is stripped out to sea, it's replaced by deeper water, because water will always seek its own level. And those deeper waters contain lots of nutrients, because everything's been decomposing down in those deeper waters. Now it comes up to the surface and has plenty of nutrients. It's as if you went out to your garden and you sprinkled miracle Grow all over your garden. So the classic thing here to look for, and we do this, is you can look at temperature at the pier, at Newport Pier, is where we do ours, Newport Beach Pier. And when you see a big drop in temperature, there was a little tiny one here, but it popped back up. But this nice long one here that goes for several days, that means those deep, cooler waters have come to the surface. And then you wait about a week, and you can bet that there's going to be some sort of a response to the phytoplankton community. And we think this is a key component of why Sudanich is, is blooming right about springtime after these events in these particular regions. And in fact, this is the most complicated slide you'll see. It's not really that complicated, because I'll put that to draw your eye. This is the samples we've taken, the toxin that we've seen in them. So again, the warm colors are high concentrations of toxin. This is the salinity. The deep, cool waters that come up are, are cold. They're colder than surface waters. And they're saltier than surface waters. So if we're right, if this upwelling of these deep waters stimulates the phytoplankton to grow and that stimulates domoic acid production, then we should see a lot of warm colors in cold, salty water. And that's basically what we're seeing. So we do think that the blooms are contributed by those factors. There is a twist, though. And the twist comes from using one of these little gliders. So this is an instrument. It's about five feet long. It's an autonomous vehicle. So you program it, and it flies through the water. And if you can see the little dotted lines, they go up and down and up and down and up and down. And this is going from onshore to a number of few miles offshore. And so the instrument just kind of goes up and down through the water like that. And it takes in, uh, measurements as it goes. And one of the measurements it looks at is chlorophyll. And again, this is indicative of the phytoplankton in the water. And, and these warm colors indicate that about 20 meters to 30 meters below the surface, there's this big lens of, of algae. We call it a subsurface chlorophyll maximum. And, and they're not necessarily present at the surface. And, and so as this layer grows here, if it is in fact growing toxic algae, we would not necessarily see it at the surface. 
And this came to our attention because there were times when we saw nothing at the surface and we were seeing sick animals that had domoic acid in them. So something was there. So our latest hypothesis has been that, hang on a sec, maybe these guys are, are toxic algae. And so what we've done is we had uh, our glider flying through this area. We couldn't find any toxin in surface waters, but the glider helped us out in that if you look at the very edge of the glider, it grows these little tiny goose barnacles because it's out for weeks at a time. And the little tiny goose barnacles, which you know, might be half an inch in size, are really good filter feeders. And so we thought, hey, you know, if they're seeing toxic algae somewhere in that deep layer that we aren't getting to, those things should be toxic. And sure enough, we pulled them off, we analyzed them, and they were hot for domoic acid. So, so we do think that that subsurface chlorophyll maximum is doing a number on us. But there's a twist. Because remember, I said, when the winds blow right, you get rid of those surface waters, they blow out to sea, and you get deep water pulled up. Well, that subsurface maximum is in that deep water. So what we're looking at now, again, is another one of these profiles. It's like a mirror or, or a uh, cross section through the ocean, where this is near shore, this is offshore. And what you can see after an upwelling event is this deep or subsurface chlorophyll max has been brought right to the surface right near the shore. And, and guess what? The, the shore there, Newport Beach Pier, was turned hot like that. High numbers going from nowhere up to very high numbers. So it's indicative that there's more than just growth going on. Growth is probably taking place down here, and it's showing up there. So th this appearance of instantaneous rather than delayed appearance of the toxin. If you look down from above, way above, like radar, and this is a MODIS radar image, and what it's showing you is the amount of chlorophyll in the water, again, the warm colors being more chlorophyll. What you can see is right along the coast, at the same time that our glider was going here to here, and you saw on the right side of that curve, you saw it warm here, and then that, that was, uh, this is the surface here, and it was not warm out there at the surface. That's where our deep chlorophyll, or that subsurface chlorophyll max is coming up. So not only are we getting a nutrient input, but we're also getting the toxic organism brought to the surface as well, at least in some of these situations. So like I said at the beginning, it's complicated. No real silver bullet. So nutrient supply, upwelling uh, uh, augments it. What about rainfall? Uh, there was, yeah, what about you know, the nutrients that are delivered? Uh, our river is kind of a river, if you can call it a river. Kind of looks like that. It's becoming a river again. So the restoration project is going to change all of that. However, that's what it looks like when it rains around here. And that is a gigantic delivery of nutrients to the ocean. So what happens? Does that stimulate a phytoplankton bloom and demoic acid? Well, the bottom answer, the bottom line is phytoplankton bloom, oh yeah, tons of nutrients in it. Not so much in domoic acid. These are three years of data. These little bars right here show you the amount of precipitation in each of the years. Here, at, uh, the, in winter of 2005, tons of water, literally. Huge amounts of water coming in. And these little hatch or, uh, gray arrows here, gray columns here, indicate the amount of chlorophyll. And that's, trust me, a lot of chlorophyll. There's a bloom going on. But the black are the demoic acid. And in this year, tons of nutrient input from river, no demoic acid. The next year, we had just a little bit of rain coming in or, or runoff going in. And we had a huge bloom. This is 2006, one of the years that you saw. And then the following year, we had virtually no input of water from the rivers. And we had another massive demoic acid year. So you know, what that means is, so far, you know, while we see discharge, river discharge creates blooms, it really doesn't seem to give us a, a demoic acid uh, burst. And there may be a number of different reasons for that. So what does it look like, uh, large picture, you know, the large view? Uh, I mentioned in 2003, that was our aha year, where we finally said it's not the problem up anymore. Uh, the high concentrations we saw in the water were very substantial, very toxic levels. We don't know what's gone on before that. Uh, we, I was working with somebody who was at the Natural History Museum at the time in 2003, and I was saying, you know, he had been there a long time. He was actually collecting the data on marine mammal deaths. And I said, you've got to have seen things like this before. 
And he said, well, you know, in the mid-1990s, we had a big unusual mortality event. And I went, aha! And, and I said, are there any specimens that are kept? And they said, well, you can check with the museum. We actually did go back, and believe it or not, we went through some dolphin heads that they had collected and kept. But we couldn't show any domoic acid, but it probably would have decomposed by then. But we would have had our smoking gun and then, you know, the bullet hole. But we didn't. Yep. Has it always failed? Has no, it, it can show a whole variety of symptoms. Like, as I said, starts with kind of nausea, vomiting, that sort of thing. Then goes into, uh, you can get short-term memory loss. If you go beyond that, you can have convulsions. So if you see a sea lion on the beach suffering from this, it's very classic. They usually will have their head way back. They're completely disoriented. And often they will go into convulsions for, for a while. But you can, they pull them out of it. They, they, if they get them rescued, they will flush them. Demoic acid is water soluble, so you pee it out like crazy. And they'll try and resuscitate, you know, re revitalize the animal, feed it, and then they put it back in the environment. Now, these are the maximal numbers we've seen in the plankton. So, you know, material filtered down. And so you could look at that and you could go, well, you know, we had a big number here. Maybe we had nothing before that. And we just do this. So we had a big number here in 2003. And then doubled that number in 2007, and then we doubled it again in 2011. There's a break here, so that number is 52. Those numbers are screeching. Luckily, that was a little tiny bloom, aerially speaking, and we didn't get toxin from that. But, you know, do you want to do that? I don't know. Do you want to do this? You want to sort of average them all out. Still looks like it's going up to me, if, if in fact we've had nothing back here. Or maybe it's periodic, and it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes, and it's going to do that. And I hate to think, but maybe every so many years, we're going to keep doubling these numbers. And I hate to see, think of that. Uh, but we simply don't know at this point. So this is where we are. Last slide. So this is where we are. How are we going to deal with this? How are we de dealing with this? We're doing a large comparative study with Central California, Monterey Bay. There is a large group of researchers up there who are looking at their hot spot. You know, we kind of call our San Pedro shelf our hot spot. We know we're going to see blooms there most years. Uh, they're studying the same thing up there, and the question is, do we have the same or different oceanography, and does it give rise to the same kinds and severities of blooms or different? And we're hoping by a comparison of those two environments, which is you know, a multi-year study, we're hoping we'll be able to get some clues as to what the specific oceanographic conditions are that seem to give rise to these things. We're working with the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, where we monitor from five peers every week. We each have a peer. We have five groups of scientists who do it in various universities. There's Scripps down on the, San, the uh, Scripps Pier. They do that. We do Newport Beach Pier. There's a group that does Santa Monica Pier. We do Santa Barbara's Pier. And we do uh, all the way up to Cal Poly. Uh, we are hoping, again, with long-term data sets, we'll have an idea of what the spatial distribution is, how recurrent these things are. We are doing uh, work in Southern California Bight to analyze and synthesize the nutrient availability. We just published a paper last year in a scientific journal where we said, OK, if we look at the river input, we look at the, the discharge input, input to the ocean, we look at storm drains, we look at aerial deposition, we look at natural sources from upwelled nutrients, what's more important? And it turns out that in across the you know, whole Southern California Bight, so from basically the border up to kind of Santa Barbara, over that range, upwelling is still the big input. But if you narrow that down and look at the greater Los Angeles area, guess what? It looks like discharges from us, in one form or another, are about on the same order of magnitude as natural inputs. That's worrisome, because it means that we may be starting to tilt the balance where we're having a significant input. Finally, uh, you know, predictive modeling is a big thing. NOAA is in this. So you know, they have predictive models for hurricanes. You can't have a hurricane without turning on the weather station and seeing these little cornucopias things. You know, where here's where the, the hurricane's going to go. And they're very good now. We're very bad right now, but we're very early on. And then we've been doing uh, some work with some of the, the dischargers in the re region who have been absolutely fantastic in allowing scientists to piggyback to look at what effluent does to the phytoplankton community when that stuff comes out the pipe. And that is, is I think, going to be very insightful for us as well. And I will quit there because I know we're way over. Sorry. Dave, thank you so much.